Hello and welcome to session number 76 of Outlander's Guide to Lidaria. Hey everyone! Hello! 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 Welcome, welcome! Hello! The, uh, I know you can hear me. I miss Winter. It's like I can <laughs> still hear her. <laughs> I'm crossing my arms dejectedly. Dejectedly. Okay, well, that's that's it for the session. <laughs> I'll see you next year. Bye, guys. <laughs> Matt has to do the summary. No, you can't escape, Dennis. The summary, as soon as the table shows up, whoop, here we are, is on you. Ooh. Oh, okay. You have to. <clears throat> All right, all right. I wrote It'll be a little compensated bit in, you know, dice. Well, someone else will get that dice. <laughs> the Spend oh, them. Wow. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Session 75. That was last one. So, after a month long break, me, the player, comes back and the party finds themselves on a bridge in this cave to find the werewolf whose wife and kids we killed, and Pip's granny's sister. Period. <laughs> On the bridge? <laughs> that's not that didn't make any sense. <laughs> well, we indirectly killed his kids. <laughs> or are at least responsible for their death. Something like that. On the bridge, one of our party members, Sunny, has to face her most recently gained biggest fear. After being traumatized in her dreams by Clown Pip, we now fight a clown-like creature on the bridge, which teleports, <laughs> and with every turn we spend on the bridge, brings the bridge closer to collapsing. I use bridge a lot in that sentence. <laughs> After defeating the clown, the party tries to rest and, and in cover without anyone noticing, Pip tries to see into the witch's dream and talks to the witch. He wants to stop playing her games and meet her instead, so she suggests a deal. We're allowed to kill her pet, the werewolf, if we are able to make it entertaining. For everyone who tried to sleep, the long rest didn't really happen, and the group tries to make the adventure interesting and walks on and on, seemingly not being able to find an end to this cave. While Virion and Aaron encourage the group to move forward, Sunny and Pip grow more impatient, questioning and irritated, and a small fight breaks out in between the group members. Pip decides to cast Dream again and talks to the witch, asking her to get out of this place. But the witch just smiles and reveals that she wants the group to be as miserable as possible. Since that is the actual game she wants to be entertained with. With a newfound determination, or anger towards the witch, Pip's behavior changes quickly. He tries to motivate everyone and makes them feel less miserable. Aaron and Virion act weirdly to that abrupt change and Pip takes a guess and steps Aaron. Luckily, he was right because the Aaron we know transformed into a snow golem. Miserable now and ready to attack. Have we been bamboozled? Is Viren also <laughs> not herself? And where the fuck are they? If they aren't <laughs> we'll hope to we'll hopefully find out in this session in the Outlander's Guide to Lidaria. Woo! Thank you. Ooh. Well done. Ooh. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful indeed. Uh, what, what would you... Oh, I lost a die. Oh, here it is. Wow, that, I wish all of my problems were solved as quickly as that one was. Uh, what shall I name <laughs> this die? Well, <clears throat> I'm not getting it. But I think since Arr, there is a chance... inspiration. <laughs> Arr. Arr. I think since... <laughs> Fake I think since there is a chance we might fight Virium, I would rather give the inspiration dice to it. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe out, so. you did this slight to, to Jory. <laughs> I'm quitting. I'm leaving forever. I'm going to pack my little bag and go. Here, All right. Hey, see you next year. No, we can cut it in half. <laughs> Aww. You should get a crappy D10 inspiration <laughs> <laughs> for really bad rolls. <laughs> you have to make it exactly color a color between green and cyan. Okay, I don't think I can change the color of these. You things. can't? 
I have the power? They're it's up textured. to me? textured. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they're, spe they're special dice. I have special dice. I genuinely <clears> do <throat> want to split it into two crappy inspirations, though. <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> Aspiration. Uh... Click, combine, attach. Oh, that would be a funny one. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, that's easy. I grab these two, and then I'm like... Boom. <laughs> oh, it's just one stupid die. <laughs> <laughs> you all have that. 28! Uh, that might be too powerful. <laughs> you just have to add them together. Yeah, it's a 10. This is... Uh, well, oh, uh, 11! I Why love 11? it. Why is it 11? What? 5 plus 6. <laughs> they both say 6 for me. It, it, because it's just one object. Oh, hmm, I see. There's an alpha die. <laughs> and Okay, Great. anyways! I'll cherish it. Oop. The current situation uh, is that you are gathered in front of this creature that used to be Arin, but has changed before your very eyes. Uh, a, a strange, towering golem of snow. And even those of you who are over a dozen feet away from it can still perceive its impossible cold. You can see a layer of frost of ice enveloping the end of its limbs, and it uh, it delineates its fists and feet, and it sort of gives it this these sharp claws. Uh, and as it rages, as Pip is stabbing it in the back, uh, it's it slams a fist into the palm of the other hand, and the strength of that gesture is so great that he shakes the entire cave. When, um, well, first of all, what would you like to do at this moment? As you see Pip moving to, um, like you, you saw Pip stabbing this thing and you see it like begin uh, to retaliate. Uh, run at it and hit it? Yeah, start a fight or continue it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Can I trip Pip? Uh, hmm? Can I trip Pip? <laughs> uh, you absolutely can. <laughs> uh, we can treat it like a contested grapple. Sure. Uh, let's do that real quick. That's the Virian we all know and love. <laughs> she's back, she's back! <laughs> Just athletics, right? Yeah. For right, you, cool. athletics, for, for Austin, <laughs> either athletics or acrobatics. Austin, Wait, gotten, I'm not good at this. Austin, keep in mind, you've gotten the inspiration for a reason. <laughs> yes, to avoid being well, might tripped. Might be time to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I can survive being tripped, I think. <laughs> okay. I, would not As... I would not expect Virian to trip me, so... Imagine... I will not re-roll. Yeah, it just... Like, suddenly there is chaos. This enormous golem of snow uh, has, like, appeared out of nowhere. Apparently it was Arin. Arin is gone. Um, and Pip, you're, like, the closest to it. Uh, the rest of the party is rushing in, and your focus, Pip, is entirely on the snow golem, and you're, like, ready to dodge its enormous fists. And what you're not ready to dodge is Virion's foot that, it, that extends just enough in front of you for you, t uh, for you to tumble, uh, not forward towards the golem, but rather backward. Uh, you end up sliding on the ice, like in the uh, on your butt, in the direction of the rest of the party. Um, and as you look up uh, in that first second of confusion, where you have no idea how you ended up on the ground and where you are and what just happened, um, you make eye contact with Virion. Uh, 
who just shakes her head and says in a very different voice from the one you're used to. Well, I suppose that is the end of this game. And you see the earring snap her fingers. Everything slows down to a crawl. The rest of the party is still running, but even as the seconds pass, you don't even progress a single step forward. Even the snow golem is almost completely still. Mid-action in the process of uh, uh, charging towards the rest of the group. The only one who moves freely is Virion, who takes her time. She stretches, just extending her arms over her head and looks around at everyone and lets out a sigh and then holds out a finger. Oh. Ah, sorry, cat situation. Ah. She holds out a finger and she does this motion as if tracing an invisible line across the air. Uh, and all of you can see this sort of... Um, as if the air concentrates into solid form. Uh, it becomes... Uh, Hard and shimmering, it's like partially translucent eyes. You can see some of the, uh, um, there's some white and some shades of blue across it. <clears throat> As a wall comes into existence, separating her and the snow golem from everybody else. And when she seems satisfied, she snaps her fingers again and everyone is moving again. Some of you slam face first against this wall that appeared out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, Tech will try to look for a path around it. Like, is it, like, fully enclosing? It goes uh. completely from one side of the cave you're in to the other. It goes all the way to the ceiling. The This part of the cave is not particularly tall. Uh, but it completely splits the cave into two. After recovering from running against the wall, can I knock against it to see if the space behind us is empty? Or if it's like solid, solid? Um, yeah, you give it a knock, and you can you can kind of feel the the knock both echoing in both your half of the cave and the other half. Uh, it's it's like knocking on steel. It's very solid, and it feels also very thick. On the other side of it, you can see kind of the, the blurry, somewhat blurry image of the golem and of Virion. Stands there for a few seconds, watching you like come to the conclusion that this barrier is impenetrable. Uh, and then, smiling, she says, I think it's about time we have a little chat. And much like Arin before her, her form shifts, and instead of becoming bigger, taller, bulkier, becomes much, much smaller. Everything that used to be Virion is completely erased and instead has been replaced by a little doll. It vaguely resembles a hawk bear plushie. It's once cute and innocent appearance, completely perverted. Its fur is rough and dirty, and its button eyes are fixated on you guys. Its stitched mouth forms uh, uh, an odd, asymmetrical, twisted grin. And despite being no taller than a foot and a half, 
it watches all of you with this brashness in its posture, chest pushed outward, not seeming uh, afraid in the slightest. This is who you're facing. <laughs> that was a very annoying trick you just pulled on us, kid. Annoying trick that we pulled on you? I think you've got it the other way around. Vidal laughs. Uh, its little high-pitched voice uh, is very weak compared to the golems who join scene in the laughter. Uh, less, a, a bit more, in, in, in a bit more of a forced manner. Uh, but when the golem laughs, the, the, the entire cave shakes and some uh, uh, icicles just drop to the ground. And... Oop! Music for them. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good news for you is that this part of the game is over. And now we move on to the f grand finale. Are you excited? Are you miserable yet? No, I think this is fun. Don't we think this is fun, everybody? Very fake smile. Big mouths. <laughs> Corners of the mouth twitching a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> Very fun. <laughs> um... The doll's button eyes can't really roll. So instead it kind of emphasizes the rest of the body movement to go with it. So you kind of guess what it's getting at. Um, and the, the doll gestures towards the golem uh, and says... I believe it's time that we set the stage for the final act. We'll be waiting for you. Oh, and... There's, uh, um... Let me give you a bit of advice. You can keep trying all you want to wake up, but it's not going to happen. So don't even bother with it. The final fight against the three of us is going to be right here in this world. The three of you. We need to go get our pet. Well, you know who I'm referring to, don't you? We do. It's a delightful story that you've been writing. We've been watching it very closely. And Bitty Bitty and I can't wait to insert ourselves into the narrative. Isn't it just so... tragic? So miserable? You killed his wife, you caused his children to die, but you were just doing the right thing, weren't you? You were saving those poor kids. It wasn't your fault, was it? You would do it again if it happened again. And now you left him with nothing, nothing but a burning desire for revenge that encompasses everything. All that matters to our pet is just to kill you. And he got close one time to getting at least one of you. But then... When you defeated him, and we snatched him from the grips of death. You. The doll points at Pip. 
You managed to kill him. And it was easy, wasn't it? You were just stabbing a little doll. You didn't get to draw any blood to see the exposed flesh. You didn't hear him scream. You killed him from halfway across the continent. How did it feel, Pip? Pip? What was it like? Pip tries to keep that smile up, but after that exchange, it just slowly started to melt like snow. And Pip now stares back through the blurry ice with a frown. And he doesn't even answer. He just squints his eyes, turns around, and starts walking back down the hallway. Hmm. Very well. I can tell you're done with this conversation. So go. Find us. We will be waiting for you. For the final act. For the end of this tragic story. We'll be here. Come on, Bitty Bitty. Let's go. The snow, the snow golem does uh, uh, its best impression of a grin and turns around and follows the doll away from you. The wall still separating you from the two of them. Guess we follow Pip. Seems we are not writing the story. Not really. It's like Granny's sister enjoys partaking. I think what you did, Pip, is the right thing. And that's probably what gets him irritated the most. Keeps the spirits up as good as possible. Dip in front of you is just... As he's walking, he's raking his fingernails along the ice uh, across the wall. Just... Watching the bits of ice uh, flake off of the walls, falling down to the ground. And he keeps his head stoically turned forwards. And uh, he kind of ignores what you just said and, and just replies, How long have we been asleep? We cannot know. Even your handle... It's just part of the dream. What matters is that Virion is awake somewhere, not here. It's time to end this story and wake up. We need to go back to where we heard them before. Maybe there's a way to get to them or the other way around. I mean, I can probably try. Right, if I can enter dreams, I can probably enter the other side as well without having to wake myself up properly. We get to that place, I can try it. Brooke, you remember? Uh, you remember that uh, a while back when you suggested to use your ability to go into what you assume to be the dream world. Aaron was very opposed to the idea, and he convinced yeah. you that it was pointless. I mean, Aaron did stop me from going into the dream world earlier. 
I guess it means there's a chance that... Or at least the dream world. I guess it means there's a chance if I do it right here, we'll be... It's the same spot. It's a risk. You can find our bodies and wake us up. I mean... Actually, we should probably be closer, because this only lasts for like a very short amount of time. They said our final fight was going to be in the dream world. That what was that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? To you? It's a, it's a chasm. It's a chasm. Oh, it's some. Oh, I thought it was more frarium in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Guess we walk until maybe we hear voices. <laughs> Making your way backwards through the tunnel, through the tunnels, makes you realize that the last bit, the last stretch of the cave you went through, when Virion was leading, you realize that she led you in circles. Once you understand where you are and which tunnels you have and haven't seen. You can actually go back in a straight line in far less time than what it had taken Virion to lead you through the same uh, distance. Uh, and as you're making your way back all the way to the place where you first heard, uh, where, where Taka first heard that voice, we're going to have um, um, a flashback to three days ago. Um, Virion? Yes? <clears throat> you and your companions have just entered this cave at the base of the mountain. <laughs> and uh, briefly, uh, after moving only a little bit into the cave, they are starting to pass out, one by one, all around you. You and Arin are exchanging a, a scared... Uh, uh, hello? G glance <laughs> um, <clears throat> and panically you're looking around and Pepe spotted something up ahead um, and you are with Pepe right now and you're pointing up at this crystal that's up in the ceiling um, and discussing with, with Arin whether it's, uh, it's worth perhaps uh, uh, destroying it or doing something with it Pepe is handing you one of his rocks and uh, uh, you toss it up to the crystal it breaks it shatters uh, and, and it, the, the pieces fall down on you, they rain on you. And you look down at Pip, who falls asleep. The cave gets very quiet uh, as all of your companions stop struggling against this magic. And they're all unconscious, all save for you and Arin. There's just this quiet panic as Virian looks at him and just shakes her head. We, we need to get them out of here. I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, Pip, are, are you okay? Pip, and she tries to wake him up. Obviously can't. All you know about sleep is uh, usually moving people, touching them lightly slapping them should snap them out of this state, but this feels less like sleep and more like having passed out from, from injuries and such, uh, because no amount of uh, shaking Pip is really doing anything. Uh, Orin gives up on attempting to get uh, either Sunny or Brooke on their feet, and uh, um, he points in the direction you guys just came from, towards the where the entrance of the cave should be, and he says... Right, uh, I, I can't carry more than one of them at a time, but uh, uh, in a few trips, we should be able to get them all out. Can you even carry Brooke? He's very big. I, I don't think I can. I think it might take the both Ooh. of us. What did you say, Dennis? Rude. <laughs> <laughs> you're, to you're so tall. You're so tall. <laughs> so tall. Pontifex <laughs> presents a similar issue just because of his armor. <laughs> Um, Where is the magic when we need it? This is armor <laughs> also so tall. <laughs> the professor can make that, that disc of magic that can carry the things. The professor is asleep right now. He's out too, I know. I... 
Okay. Uh, well, there's ice on the let's... floor. I don't maybe we can slide them. <laughs> I, the cave is quite icy. Um, yeah. Let's get to work. Um, you, you're basically already holding Pip, Virion. Uh, so mm -hmm. you begin with him. Uh, you just pick him up in your arms. This kid is he's so light uh, in your grasp and um, you're struck once again by the thought of how unusual it is that someone this young is on a journey so perilous. Um, and right now his life, along with everyone else's, is in your and in Arian's hands. So with Pip held tight against your chest, you take a few steps back in the direction where you guys came from and you immediately come to a stop as there is a figure there that uh, you didn't see before. <clears throat> you see a woman with uh, very dirty hair uh, and uh, clothes that have obviously that are old that haven't been taken care of in a long time. She has uh, branches and leaves in her hair and her fingernails are more like claws. Uh, but despite looking rather old, uh, her body being hunched forward a little bit and, and looking also quite thin, um, like her muscles have just dried up, leaving just her skin and her bones behind. Despite all that, she has this energy in her eyes and in her expression uh, and she doesn't seem to feel the cold at all she's just uh, she's barefooted and looking at uh, the two panicked elves and with a smile saying now that is a surprise I did not expect to meet other dreamers in my house how can I help you? I think just instinctively, Viren holds Pip a little bit tighter. And it's very it kind of laser focused past her. We need to leave. We're, we're leaving. All of us. I'm afraid that I can't let you do that. You see, I don't get that many visitors, and up here in the cold, in the snow, I get so hungry for such long periods of time. And now that some delicious food has showed up on my doorstep, I'm just supposed to let you all go? Aaron steps forward. Uh, he has given up on uh, moving the, the fur bolts and instead he uh, holds his bow and gives Viren a look that, like, without words, says we can take her. Mm -hmm. Viren is already reaching for the gun. <clears throat> uh, and as you're preparing to fight, uh, the woman looks back, away from you, behind her. And uh, both of you have pretty good passive perception. Mm -hmm. um, and you can hear something approaching. <clears throat> and at first, you're not really quite sure how many footsteps you're hearing. There's too many to count. None of them are really footsteps. They, don't, they certainly don't belong to people. It's more of a, of a skittering. And around the corner, first you see the shadows. Many, many, long but very thin shadows. Dozens and dozens. And then you begin to hear the sound of something more mechanic in nature than natural. Uh, something that resembles more the sound of, of cogs rotating than uh, of uh, anything soft or made of flesh. Um, 
around the corner begin to pour out boys, plushies, dolls, um, giant animals and creatures and small creatures, all made either of bits of, uh, of wood or felt or a combination of them. Uh, some of them with stuffing falling uh, out of them uh, from their old stitches. Uh, some leaving behind a trail of uh, uh, bits of wood where the cogs are grinding against one another. Um, it's a, an odd sight, a tiny army of toys following this woman. <clears throat> Virian uh, gives yep. Aaron, Aaron a look. I'm much less confident of we can take them, right? Uh, and as Aaron catches your the, the way you're looking at him, you see his hands shake a little bit, and then he he cocks an arrow into the the string of the bow and he lets it go. Uh, let's go to first strike. Um, are you going to join him in this battle? Yes. Yeah, Virion just quickly like puts Pip down behind her, pulls her shield out, and like one motion just pulls out her gun and fires. Okay. So, me as the DM will tell you that this is son impossible mm -hmm. feat to achieve uh, but for for the sake of, narr of the narrative I'd let you roll like um, let's make it an attack roll sure. just to see how long the two of you hold out and I, I will do the same for Aaron <laughs> you did better than he did. Uh, oh no, actually, I forgot how his, his bonus is. So he rolled a 5 and his bonus is a plus 12. So that's actually also 17. Ooh. Um, okay. Let me get back to my notes. Actually, I, I didn't change my bonuses. Apparently, it went up one last time we leveled, so it's one more than that. Okay, 18. You and Aaron could easily take on any one of these... Uh, uh, well, maybe creatures is not the correct word. Uh, any one of these machines, toys, constructs. Uh, you could perhaps take each of you 10, maybe 20, and maybe 20 together, but... You are defeated by the sheer number of them, rather than the strength of any of them. Um, you find that, uh, for example, you see you find that the giant snails, um, their wooden shells are filled with acid. You 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 manage to shoot at one, and it explodes, and and uh, un unvertedly, the, you're sprayed with acid when this happens. Uh, you find that uh, despite uh, not being actual snakes, these winged serpents, uh, their bites still feel sharp and solid, like as if the fangs are real, and they still feel poisonous. With every bite, you feel a little bit weaker, not just from the blood loss, but from something foul coursing through your veins. Uh, Any time you try to focus on the woman, it's as if she's in an entirely different spot from where you thought she was. Neither of you lend a blow on her. You're trying um, not to fall back. You're trying to maintain your position to remain between her and your companions. But eventually, one by one, they are dragged away by the biggest toys. And anytime you turn your attention towards one of them to save one of your companions, two more get dragged away. You are helpless. You watch each of your allies being taken further into the cave by one toy or another. 
and when you're too weak to give chase. When you realize that uh, this might actually be the end for the two of you. It seems that the woman is satisfied. From a safe distance from the two of you, she says, I will give you one small gift. I will be preparing my meal by taking my sweet time. I will be slow cooking this misery and I will enjoy every bite. So, make good use of what little time you have. Despair as you look for your friends. I want to fill your misery. I will feast upon it. And the woman, the woman leaves. Lady, you and Aaron bleeding on the frozen, uh, on the frozen ground of this cave. Your companions having slept through the entire fight. You're all alone. It takes you a while to regain your strength to even be able to, to move, to speak. You can feel Arin shuffling back to his feet and then pulling uh, someone roughly on your arm to also bring you back uh, to stand next to him. You can, uh, one of his eyes is very swollen. Uh, he spits out blood and simply says, we need to find them. We don't have much time. We need to go. Now. You don't really have the energy to say anything else. So you go. The two of you alone locate your companions. You have to take regular breaks. But eventually your open wounds stop bleeding and you regain enough strength to give chase. And the cave itself, as you run through it, it feels like it is alive and it is actively stopping you from making any progress. Each of the tunnels all begin to look the same and there's a feeling in the back of your mind that tells you that maybe they are. Maybe you're going in circles. Maybe the walls are shifting whenever you're not looking. The hours pass. You need to stop the trends. And then you resume chasing. But there's there's not a trail left behind. No footsteps. No signs of anyone having passed through any of the tunnels that you have been traveling through. And uh, about halfway through your second day of finding absolutely nothing you pause to catch your breath and Arin kicks a rock out of frustration and he says this isn't working we have to find another way there has to be a way they can't have vanished into thin air uh, I... We can't find them here. We, there's no way for us to follow them, to find them. They might not... They're not a, awake. Right. I'm, I don't... Oh. 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 Oh, you, you're saying... Because they're sleeping, that they... Their spirits. I think they do. They, they go in. in yeah. <sighs> well, la last time, 
Um, when we were attacked in in their dreams, they could sort of go back and forth. I don't fully understand it, but I was brought there and I could fight there. Can you do that again? If you could, if you could go to to the dream world to our rule, then maybe you might be able to wake them up. I I don't know how. I can I had someone holding my hand quite literally. Okay, well, I can, but only for a few seconds at a time. Uh, still, it's worth trying. And he holds out a Ma hand towards you. Maybe between the two of us we can figure this out. She'll take his hand. He gives you a firm, determined nod. You hold his hand as tight as you can, and then you close your hand around nothing. Arin vanishes, stepping into the world of dreams, but you are left behind. For a few seconds, all you can do is just stand there. He comes back, no more than 30 seconds afterwards, reappearing as if having just uh, uh, manifested back in front of you from a state of nothing more than invisibility. He shakes his head and says, <laughs> they're not here. And also, that didn't work. I mean, it worked for me. I couldn't bring you along. No, it was a, a good good try, though. Uh, I can try this a few more times, so all we have to do is just move elsewhere and do it again. And hope we're in the right spot. They've got to be around here somewhere. We'll find them. Right. He takes the lead, running down yeah. another set of tunnels. When he feels like you have covered a sufficient amount of ground and you're in a big another opening of the cave, you stop and he vanishes again, comes back, shakes his head. You do this two more times, four total, spreading out each of uh, his ethereal steps, seeking out different locations, and every time... Well, the first three times he finds nothing, but on the fourth he says he at least has found signs of something or someone having been somewhere uh, having found uh, uh, evidence of a conflict of some kind broken ice shattered melted in some places and as small as that bit of news is it still feels like at least some amount of progress but your companions have been gone for nearly two entire days and you have no idea if they're even alive. And the more hours pass without finding them, the more it kills you. To think you've come this far just to lose them like this, just because you can't chase them into the world of dreams, it, it's miserable. Eventually you're both tired enough where you have to rest. You find a comfortable enough spot in this cave. Endless, it seems. You put down your blankets, your tarps, you sit ready to trance again, but it's difficult. It's difficult to get your thoughts away from this situation, to stop worrying enough to start resting. If only you could figure it out. Everybody else can do it. All other humanoid races can sleep and wake up. Animals can do it. Why can't you? For what reason is this beyond you? Ladarians and even Arin at least have figured out a way to perhaps not exactly sleep and wake up across the worlds, but move themselves between one and the other. Why should that also be out of your reach? And as you're thinking about all this, you... Feel, you, you hear this light shuffle next to you and you open one eye to see that the Arin is looking at you and has noticed the, uh, that the distress you're in and he scoots over to sit right next to you and he lets out a sigh he says 
I've already let Talix down. I can't let the professor down. Hip is just a kid. And everyone is... They don't deserve any of this. You're powerless. This... I've lost a lot of people. I know what it's like. This is... different. I know what it's like to be powerless. This is... This one thing. Just one thing keeping us away. And if we can figure that out, it's just the one piece. It's it's almost worse than being powerless. There's, I don't know, a, a comfort in knowing there was nothing else that you could do. But it just feels like we're missing something. Something so obvious. I... This idea... That the elves have been sleeping this whole time. That this, what we call life, is just a dream. That we're actually elsewhere, that our bodies are elsewhere. It's. I was so excited when I came up with that theory, when I realized that maybe that's what's going on, that, that Lidaria could teach us something about ourselves. I was dreaming of going back home and writing books about it and changing the world. Now I hate every bit of it. I don't understand it. Why it's different from us. Why we have this single, centuries-long dream. What's the other side even like? Why can't we just wake up? I don't know about you, but since I've learned all of this, there's part of me that's afraid to wake up. I've, I've lived so long, this life so long, hundreds of years. Whatever might be waiting for us, if we can wake up, when we can wake up, terrifying. Don't you think? Not knowing, it's... It's scary. Everything I know and love is here. Did I leave something behind? Other things, other people I cared about and loved? Do they miss me? Are they waiting for me to go back? Ugh driving me insane but gods I just really this is going to change everything back in Plurina this idea this concept we, we don't even think of dreams the way Ladarians do we don't think of them as this separate world we just think it's in people's heads maybe we can change more than that if we're in the middle of this strange revolution of sorts, finding out more things about Plurn and how the universe actually works, I'd like to believe that we can make something out of it. I mean, who says that we can't wake up? Maybe no elf in history has ever just tried. Because we never believed it possible. While Arin is speaking, Virian's fidgeting with her scarf, something underneath her collar. And then she takes out the, the crescent moon necklace, the one that Vonin gave her. And she turns it over in her hands, says, I've been given a few things to think about. About the way we've always thought about dreams, about <laughs> gods, about... I, 
I've sp spoken face to face with. I suppose if if it's to be believed, ma many gods here, but specifically one from Plurna, one who was here, who maybe has knows dreaming. I don't. I'm still. This is still just very confusing. I still can't believe that any of you have met with and talked to any gods. He was very nice, actually. Passing. Was he? Oh, yes. Um, had a lot of encouragement. <laughs> well, maybe he can help you. I think you could ask for a little helping hand. He's, he said if I needed anything. So I've never done this before, I mean... I don't know the proper way I... I've never really been a prayer person, if that's even what I need to be doing, but... And she just sort of grips that necklace, the little star boba glowing on the same chain. Just... If... if you can hear me, if... I don't know how this works, but I could... We really need some help right now. You say the words out loud and you close your eyes and you open them back immediately a second later as if expecting something to have changed in your surroundings. For God himself to manifest in front of you in the same cave and... Well, nothing happens at that moment, but you don't give up hope. You Again, you're kind of new to this praying thing, <laughs> but... You decide to just be patient and... Give it the best try that you can. You hold on to um, your glowing symbol and you adjust your position a little bit to be a bit more, com more comfortable as you figure that this might take a while. And you pray. And you don't know for how long exactly. At some point it feels like you're kind of shifting into your state of trance more than your full consciousness and you wonder if maybe that actually might be helpful and you let it happen and you know that time is passing and Arian is letting you focus your prayers turn from begging to more of a almost like just a half of a conversation just explaining what's going on what you're going through what you need right now trying not to sound too desperate and then definitely sounding desperate because maybe you have to communicate the urgency of the situation you don't even know exactly what in what form you expect this help to come but whatever the wolf or anyone who's listening might be able to do you're going to need it you'll take all the help you can get and then you feel a tug on your stomach you try to open your eyes and you do. And you feel pulled, slingshotted across immense distances. Viren, you wake up and you're surrounded by white in every direction. Feels like there's something in this whiteness, but it's really hard to see anything your surroundings are blurry they're confusing they're odd they make your head ache you feel sick feel like your entire body doesn't quite fit you anymore it's alien to you you don't know where you are you don't know what's going on but you feel like you are not alone and you turn your head to try to see if Arian is there but you don't know if that's Arin. You don't even know if that's a person. You sense an entity next to you, but you can't figure out what they look like. You get this vague feeling that they might be humanoid, but you can't even tell if that's a, a god or a mortal being. That's a thing or a living creature. 
there's just something, someone with you. And when they speak to you here, you understand the meaning of the words more than you hear a voice. In fact, you're not even sure if you're hearing words. It would be more akin to, to hearing concepts beaming straight into your mind. But whatever, whoever this being is, they communicate to you something along the lines of, you're here early. Oh boy. I think there's just a very, very long pause as Virian tries very desperately to get her bearings, figure out what's going on, just cannot grasp everything and just sort of gives up on it. And after a while, just responds with, Where is here? You try to get the feel for the tone, the emotion of the voice that speaks to you, but you can't. The harder you try, the more it hurts your head. So you have no idea if this person is amused by your confusion or, or if they're patient and trying to help you. You just get the concept that they're communicating to you right now, which is simply, I could try to explain, but I don't even know if you would remember any of my explanation. Not to mention that you don't have a whole lot of time, do you? No, I have... My friends are in trouble, they're sleeping, and we can't wake them up. Not from where we were, so... We need to figure out how to get to where they are. Luckily for you... I can help with that. Here, hold out your hand. She uh, does so. Very trusting, just best thing she can do right now is just try whatever this is. You hold out your hand and then you look down at your arm and You didn't really recognize it. Your scars are gone. None of the symbols of the life you've led, of all the fights you've gotten into, there, it's all gone. Your clothes, you don't recognize them either. It feels like you have entered someone else's body. Still, even though your hand shakes a little bit, you maintain the position. And the being... You see them moving, holding out their own hands towards your own, sliding something around one of your fingers. You feel something tight, a ring. And the being takes a small step, a step away from you and then does a gesture, but if everything is too blurry, too bright, too white for you to really see what it is. And they say, Everything has been the same for a long time. There are no rules against changing this. I don't see why we shouldn't start here. So then, you're free to go. Make the most of this gift. And make the most of your life for those who didn't have the chance to. Will you promise me? I promise. Swear it. I will see you again. Whenever the time is right.
instinctively, you turn around. It felt like the end of a conversation. It's time for you to leave. But then you realize you don't quite know where to go. But a moment later, you feel that tug on your stomach again. And you are thrust across time and space. And you open your eyes again. Arin is trancing in the middle of this frozen cave. You feel the cold seeping into you again. You look down to find that your body is the body that you recognize again. You are yourself. Everything is fine. Everything is no longer all white. There is a ring around uh, one of your fingers that wasn't there before. It feels cold, but not the kind of cold of this cave. It's cold like simple metal is cold. It's smooth and it's perfectly white. So white that it doesn't even seem to cast a shadow. I think just after a few seconds, Virion just grabs R and just like shakes his shoulder. Uh, <laughs> Virion! I don't know if I did what I wanted to do, but I did something, and I, I, I think we're, we're at least one step closer. We're one step closer. I think we can think. I think I can figure this. I think I can do this. I think maybe I can do this. What's going on? I don't know. Um, I think you just have to trust me on this one. Okay, okay. I trust you. I trust you. Okay. At least one of us does. And she'll grab his hand and does not know what she's doing, but tries to grab onto that feeling that she just felt, that being pulled, being grabbed, just being shunted somewhere else. You move without taking a step. In fact, it feels more like you stand still and the entire rest of the world is turned upside down. And you feel like you're being pulled somewhere, but while the rest of your body shifts a little bit and is pulled and pushed, your left hand, where the ring is, it remains still. As if it anchors you to this location. The surroundings change. But you remain here, as you successfully shift into the world of dreams. The cave you're in looks a little different. Uh, the shape is roughly the same, uh, but there are things in here that weren't here a moment ago. Uh, mainly the shape of various icicles and stalagmites, uh, their arrangement is different. You also see a tunnel that wasn't there before, a different exit. And also, it's bright in here. There's a source of light roughly from where you're standing and you look around, you look at Arin who is staring at you bright-eyed and you turn and turn and turn and you realize that it's you. You are emitting light. Your equipment is pure white. Arin looks no different here, but you do. You know, this happened last time too. I don't. Let's just find. We can think about. The, let's just go find them. I, I don't know how much time we have. Okay. Yes, I'll be filing this. For, for later. We'll talk later. Am I am I here? Am I actually here? Am I uh I'm not fading, am I? I mean, I I guess I can let go of your hand for now. Um Still you're still good, you don't He remains still for a few seconds and then a few more. He takes a step. Uncertain takes another step, turns around, and says, okay, usually by now I'm gone. I I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> what did you do? Nope, talk later. We need to find them.
And he points and at just, the one tunnel yeah. that wasn't there before and says, uh, I, this way? Let, let's go. It's all we have to follow. And so you run. And this part of the cave is drastically different from everything you've seen thus far. You see signs of people having been here. You find footprints. You, uh, you find scratches. You find a wall that has been dug into. You keep following until you hear voices up ahead. And for the rest of the party, you hear footsteps running as you're retracing your steps right to the point where he, uh, where Tekka thought he heard uh, um, where he thought he heard Arnus voice earlier. Both groups turn around a corner and you find each other. Or at least the party thinks that they found Aryan and someone else and he takes a few moments to even recognize uh, Virion. Or uh, if you bring your eyes to her model, you know, it looks like this. Wow. New mini, new mini. What? Amazing. Pretty cool mini. Oh, what? <laughs> she hot though. <laughs> <laughs> she was always hot, okay? <laughs> There's just a silence for a second, and Virion just rushes forward and just sort of scoops Pip up, just hugs him. How do we know this is you and not some other game? Why would it be anyone but me? Because the last time you hugged me, you were actually a doll in disguise. <laughs> You know, oh. I have a lot to unpack later. I'll just add that to the list. <laughs> <laughs> Arin was awkwardly moving up to also hug Pip, but then like he stops at, the, at his protests and just stands a few steps away and clears his throat and says, um, <clears throat> um, it sounds like you've been through a lot. I'm sorry it took us so long to find you. How, how long has it been? How long glances, have we been asleep? He glances over at Viren and tilts his head and says, About three days. Give or take. Three days. Uh, look, we can, we can, uh, have a reunion later. I, we don't know how much time you have left. On a bit of a time crunch right now, um... I, I'll fill you in. I Actually, I don't know where we're going at this point anymore. Um, I had it planned further than this. Someone has prepared a finale. A doll and a golem has prepared a grand finale. The next game. Okay, just for so we can be on the same page, is that more or less important to you than a uh, weird old lady is trying to eat you? Um. Wouldn't be surprised if they aren't connected. Sad. All we know is that. When she, uh, her, her toys, I guess, actually, not her, dragged you off, she made a big deal about how she needed a good meal and your misery was going to be it. And I don't know if it was just a figurative thing or literal, and I'm honestly really not, don't want to find out the hard way. 
Sunny holds up a trembling finger and says, I would rather not be eaten. Okay, fine, I'll tell you. She's eating our misery. And I've been trying to make us happy, but it's not working because I'm really not happy. Well, it kind of worked, though. It, you you made them both shed their disguise, and at least we got rid of them. You, you did good, Pip. Yeah, I wouldn't have to get that out. I don't know how you did that. Well, the game's almost over. We just... We just have to finish it. I'm so glad you both are here, but how? How are you here? Why are you... Why do you look... I don't understand. You know? I don't really 100% know either, only that... Um... I think I'm getting a handle on this being awake, but also not awake at the same time, sleeping elf situation. You're, you're all as asleep. I don't know if I told you that um, you're sleeping. Right now you're dreaming, which is why I'm here like this. And I not. I'm glad to see you all. I've been worried. It's good to see you, too. And you are. I'm glad you're not a snowman. <laughs> I. Any time, Pip. Any time. The good news is that. I think we can. Guess that if you are still dreaming, then you are also still alive. So we're not out of time yet. Just got a, um, got a, uh, what, what do we do? What do we do now? Now we have to walk all the way back to the wall again. Which wall? They made Deeper. a wall. Deeper down the cave. We have been walking for a while. Met them. And they told us they are preparing the final stage. So we can show off against those three. Okay, tell me what. I don't really know what that means, but then again, we have a lot of things that we can question later. But now you seem to know where we're going, so I'll follow you. Lead the way. I'll be right with you. And as you begin to walk, Aryan will lean towards uh, uh, Tekka and say, So if, if someone was impersonating me, did, did they say anything embarrassing I, or mean? Cause, uh, obviously, I didn't mean any of it. Not that I noticed. This cave is playing tricks upon us again and again. Items exchanging hands being where they shouldn't be. Your actor did not embarrass you. Sounds like you've had a much more exciting time than we did. We've just been running in circles for days. That sounds very familiar. Narin seems satisfied with the reply and the focuses on the journey up ahead. Uh, Winter, one question. Yes? Does Virion's equipment look the same as it did in the dream version of the tower when we had the fight with the werewolf? Yes, she looks like that. Very cool. There's the the clothes are the same. Uh, the fact that like her scars are gone, her skin is smooth, and she doesn't seem to have sustained a single injury in her life. That's all the same. Um, 
Air equipment is what's completely white and emanating this bright light that it kind of hurts to look directly at. And you see that as she's walking, she's sort of like messing with it. And whenever she draws her blade, she does so out of nothing. She doesn't really have a sheath. And when she sheaths her weapon, the weapon just vanishes and is no longer on her side. And you see her testing this with her gun as well. You don't see her weapon on her, but when she reaches for it and holds it, it's now there and it's completely white. The only thing it has in common with the pistol that she used to have is the shape, but it is otherwise completely white and emitting light. It's like it's made of light itself. That applies to a, um, a great amount of her equipment. Most things on her are either not visible um, and only visible when she holds them, when she reaches for them, when she needs them, or they are on her person, but made of white light anyway. As if Vera I... wasn't cool enough already. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> uh, and also for, for um, like, mechanically speaking, you have all of your equipment, Ajori. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and none of it acts in any different manner. That includes also your, your armor, your shield. Sounds good. So by the, just talking about Virian's appearance, like the one difference between last time and this time is that she's got a very prominent crescent moon glowing on her neck. A necklace. And the ring. And the ring. Amazing. Actually glowing. Yeah. I don't know if Winter can turn down the lights, but it's I mean, it very cool. glowing. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's just how, how it is. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> how yeah. is it actually glowing? I pay three dollars a month on Hero Forge, but <laughs> <the> lights. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> Money. Money. By the time oh, wow. you return to the cave where you had your confrontation with the snow golem and with the plushie, that magical shimmering wall is gone. It feels like it was never there in the first place. There's no trace of this barrier ever having existed, uh, existed and ever having cut the cave in half. Uh, and you proceeded then further? Mm -hmm. I believe Let's so. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Let's go. For the first time, and this applies to all of you, including uh, Viren and Arim, but for the first time, you feel like Misery's womb is not fighting back against you. You feel like the environment is no longer trying to hold you back. And the fact that you no longer have uh, a couple of uh, of people intruding in your group and actively sabotaging you, you no longer come across any traps, no more marbles are poured onto you, no more items disappear and reappear on different people. Nothing attacks you or slows you down, and the cave no longer feels like it's folding in on itself. Um... By the way, I'm blaming Jory for the majority of those things. They were her <laughs> ideas. Yeah, sorry about that. Not sorry. She, she wanted to like hug Pip and reverse pit pocket things into him, uh, into his pockets. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember like three or four sessions ago when someone was like, hey, Virian's being really trolly today. What's up with that? <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we were having a laugh. In, in our, mm -hmm. like, private Discord. And <laughs> every time someone made a comment like that. Mm -hmm. Ah, you, you got close. <laughs> Eventually, the cave opens up into an era you haven't seen before. 
Uh, moments before you turn around one more corner, you hear a chuckling, a familiar one, this high-pitched voice that belongs to not quite a creature, not quite an animal, not quite a construct. Whatever that doll was, you, the its voice is grating on your ears, and you know your clothes, and you know that uh, you have been providing entertainment to these monsters. And uh, it's upsetting. And you're honestly kind of ready to just put an end to this. So as you turn around a corner, the cave that opens up before you is just another section of uh, this system. Not particularly different from any other wider opening in the cave that you've gone through thus far. Um... Uh, filled with twisting walls, stalagmites and stalactites. Uh, and with this chuckle echoing across the, for the most part, empty space, a voice calls out, Here they finally are. And we are ready as well. We brought our pet. And you hear the sound of chains being dragged across the floor. And uh, this is where we'll take a five minute break. Oh, right. Boy. Nice. Four. Ooh, nice. You will it. be, oh, let me bring a, a grid. Oop. You will be on this side. Uh, just place yourselves wherever you want on this side of the cave. And I'll bring back your health bars. Um, ooh, Jory, your um, yeah. the way the health bar works with your mini is that mm -hmm. they're, they're essentially unique to each form of your mini. So like okay. if you lose some health and then later you have to bring this back, it will be. Oh, never mind. What? That's oh. not how it worked earlier. Whoa. 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 Okay, never mind. I take it back. It didn't work like that when I tested it. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, yeah, there you go. Nice. The, the the one thing that doesn't carry over is that the orientation. Like if I turn this, yep. uh, and then I we change back to the other one, it will be tilted. Nice. Uh, but but you, you know, you I was, say, I was gonna ask if you had a had a change if I figured it out. Yeah. Nice. Uh, okay. So five minute break, toilet break, um, and uh, then we'll begin the fight. Yeah. Oh boy. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, yo. See you in a little bit. Right. Yeah. Let's go. See you in a little bit. You're all stepping into this wide section of the cave, uh, preparing yourselves for combat. You can hear the voice of the doll um, calling out to you from a distance, and you can hear the, the rattling of chains. Sound that has gotten somewhat familiar to you guys by now. Um... There's a lot of obstacles, a lot of stalagmites in the way, but you can see movement uh, across the cave. Uh, and as the doll um, happily announces, It's time to put an end to this tale. You may all roll initiative. Ooh. I can't find my table. There's too many rocks in the way. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Um, and oh, 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 he's not even on the table. Where's Arin? Here's Arin. Oop. Real Arin. Back in the game. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, also, I forgot about trying to purposely stand more than 25 feet away from everyone during every combat encounter. Ah. <laughs> not, 
Uh, yeah, not giving uh, her bonuses to you guys. So smart. <laughs> Forgot about that one. Jory has been not only a delightful sport, but also just very helpful. I gotta go full gremlin mode. Okay. Ah, uh, just so missing the Tristan. A white werewolf. Biffy Biffy and Nifty Swifty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the doll has called the, the golem Bitty Bitty. Bitty bitty. And I think you were right the very start the golem referred to the to the doll as Nefifi. I love them. I can't wait um, to kill them. <laughs> uh who's controlling Pontifex? Is it Austin? It's me. Okay. So well 13, 14. Uh I, I believe the the Tressim has her own initiative. So uh, but you'll be controlling her. Oh, okay. Let's go back to here. Okay. Um. Right. So, ah, oh. ah, oh, one of them is all the way down at the bottom of the initiative. Um. As everyone's focus is. Uh, on uh, the sound of chains dragging on the ground. Um, you hear the voice of the doll calling out. We have brought the protagonist of this tale. Of course, we can't finish this story without him. You never even learned his name, and I think he would be far more miserable and so much more tragic if you never did. He will be forgotten by everybody, including the people who killed him twice. As for us, though, the new side carters that have inserted themselves into this narrative I think we deserve a bit of an introduction. We spent so much lovely time together, after all. Um. D -d -d Hold on. Sorry, one second. Just look into my notes real quick. Uh, okay. That's good. I forgot to open this, but we're good, we're good. Uh, pardon that. Uh, so... The, <laughs> <laughs> the the echo across the cave really helps with like projecting one's voice. Um, so uh, the uh, the doll says, "We decided to help out because, well, all of you. Uh, how many of you are there now? Like half a dozen. All of you against just one just didn't really seem fair. So here we are." I am Netherionet, and my friend here is Bitterfrost. We've had a lot of fun with you. Let's play our final game. Brooke, you are the first to act. All right. <clears throat> I'm choosing my sword. Starting to hurt myself first. Activating the right. Mm -hmm. And then using my action to dash. You slide your blade across the palm of your, of your hand. Uh, you bleed like you have so many times. And from your blood, you draw this power. You transfer it into your sword. Uh, these creatures have been messing with you for too long. You rush up ahead. You're ready. Exactly. Alright, that's my turn. Okay. Uh, Orin, which I'll be controlling for now. So, uh, da, 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 here's his uh, Carter sheet. I'm going to put it over here because that's more helpful. <clears throat> his base speed is 35. Uh, I think he's going to dash right along with Brook. Uh, keeping a tiny bit of a healthy distance as he's. Uh, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
not exactly a frontliner, but he still needs to be able to find uh, uh, to find his shot. Maybe he'll be hiding behind the stalagmites so and not go too far. Um, this uh, none of his bonus actions are helpful right now, so he's just dashing ahead with his action and uh, um, preparing for what's to come. Virion. All right. Uh, also running. And they're going to bonus action dash. Line butt. <laughs> is, that, is that 60? I lost. I lost count. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Yeah, should be. Okay, cool. Better. And then she draws her sword, for lack of a better term, just sort of acts like she's drawing it, but it sort of just appears in her hand. Mm -hmm. And she's going yeah. to hold an attack for when something gets within stabbing range. Oh, right, because you can dash as a bonus action. Yep, because I'm a rogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and indeed, everyone else behind her can see her performing the act of drawing a weapon, but it's more like she manifests it into existence, wielding pure light against uh, your enemies. Sunny, which is uh, Dennis. Uh-huh. She will also dash. Keeping up with uh, Virion and Brooke, ready, uh, ready for combat. <coughs> uh, anything as a bonus action? No. All right. Now, all the way back here, this doll that used to be clearly a hawk bear plushie. Um, hmm? I think there's many eggs to the fur bogs. It's always really funny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this tiny little thing that under any other circumstances would just be this like old discarded toy. Um, you've seen it earlier. Um, stop time itself and craft space around you in order to uh, buy himself and his friend some time uh, just to taunt you, uh, just to walk away from you and leave you with, with nothing, uh, leave you unable to chase after him. Um, whatever he did, for those of you who are magic attuned, you would understand that, that uh, he, he is a spellcaster. He can do magic. He can do spells. Um, and... Uh, you guys are very far <laughs> right now. Uh, how far did I put him from the others? I feet too far. <laughs> okay, then Nefarinet is going to hold out uh, one of his uh, uh, tiny little stumpy arms towards Perfrost, uh, and he's going to say, All right, my old friend, let me give you a hand. Uh, Nefarinet will just hold a casting of a spell. And Tekka. Tekka will address the group. This is their playground. Their sandcastles will hide teeth of coral. Take step by step. As he will advance slightly in a different direction and then take a dodge action. That will be the end of the day. Okay. Tekka, you, you move ahead with uh, uh, less boldness than your um, than your other companions, uh, um, knowing to be prepared for anything. Uh, any trap could be sprung on your feet at any moment. The cave itself has felt hostile towards you guys this whole time. So um, you suspect even the walls. Uh, you remain cautious and alert and ready for anything. What does Seraphis do? Surface is dashing. 
She flies. Oh. Speed. Oh. I don't know her speed. It is 40 feet. Yeah, it took 45. Yep. Mm. Each of these elevations, they're five feet up. So this is five and this is 10 and this one is 20. We'll go here then. Okay. She flies all the way up and for just a moment, Pontifex watches through her eyes and gets a better view of everything that is beyond all of these obstacles um, and can see the werewolf as Pip had described him uh, just over three days ago now. Uh, not too... Uh, still it, hard to recognize compared to the last time the rest of you saw him. Um, he is bloated, swollen. Uh, his fur is streaked with dried, dark blood. Uh, parts of his skin exposed where the fur has fallen out is this unnatural bluish color. The majority of the rubies that adorned his body, uh, they have fallen out. There's just these small patches of gemstones left behind that are cracked. Uh, some of his fangs and claws are also broken off. And there is a chains now that don't really bind him to anything. They just extend, they just bind his, his wrists, not together. Just each wrist has a chain that dangles from it. Uh, one around his neck and uh, one around each of his ankles. Uh, that as he moves, you can, you can hear him come uh, before you see him. And despite the fact that this man, uh, this werewolf, this Krelko, is now undead the moment he comes around the corner and sees the rest of you uh, his uh, otherwise uh, um, grayish cloudy eyes they regain this focus uh, whatever is left of this man uh, inside of him it's all just this fury this revenge-driven anger. He leaps towards all of you. Jesus. Charging at full speed, going for the one that he, this cluster of people recognizes. Which is uh, Rook. So once he charges, Virion had a attack ready for mm -hmm. when he got close. We did with that so first. She, uh, so she will make a swing and she'll cast Booming Blade. Okay. I hit him. Can you do that? Mm hmm You're so cool. <laughs> Might miss, though. No. Use our uh, combined... Would you roll <laughs> a 13? A 13. 13 hits. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. All right, so <laughs> that's... Uh... Sorry, looking for my things. There. And a sneak attack and do D8 thunder damage. Alright, that's six thunder and then the rest of that is piercing. So... 18 piercing, six thunder. Got it! And he's all... He's got like the, the dubstep womp womp around his feet. <laughs> You've learned wow. well from Pontifex. <laughs> um, you strike with your blade of light, and despite it feeling lighter than what you're used to, it also feels like it's almost like the weapon itself is perfectly shaped to fit exactly in your hand, in your fingers, in your grasp. Um, you, despite the moment of shakiness, you, you strike at this creature, uh, and you draw blood. Uh, you don't smell it though it doesn't smell like blood it just smells like rotten flesh it's an overwhelming uh, disgusting kind of smell uh, your blade makes contact and opens a gash and despite the fact that this wound is an actual deep wound the werewolf doesn't feel it or doesn't act like he feels it uh, and he continues to attack brook uh, okay, let me just scroll all the way here. 
Uh, he tries to attack her. So... Uh, this will be three attacks. Uh, uh, she is plus this. So I have 23 to hit. Uh-huh. Uh, the second one uh, is a 17 to hit. Nope. And then a 12, which also misses. So only the first one, only the first bite um, manages to hit you. Uh, you feel its fangs closing around one of your forearms. Uh, and then it's really difficult for you to like shake him off afterwards. Uh, but you struggle with all of your might. Uh, uh, and you pull away before it can land another hit on you. Uh, this is 26 points of uh, uh, magical piercing damage. Is it magical? Yeah, it is magical. Oh, and I need a constitution saving throw. Yep. And that's it for the werewolf's turn. Pip. Pip is going to. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Pip is going to move up. Uh, sort of peering around the spire to where the white werewolf is, and Pip is clutching his doll close, still uh, formed in the image of this werewolf who they have such a storied history with. And uh, after Pip sees Virion's booming blade connect, Pip uh, puts his hand forward and uh, green writing inscribes itself on the iron ring across his finger. Uh, and green sparks emerge from his hand as he casts Create Bonfire <laughs> right here with a green uh, bout of flame crawling up his back. Mm -hmm. um, needs to make a dexterity saving throw. That is a 24. Okay, he succeeds. Uh, and then Pip uh, holds out the doll and takes his Skyward uh, dagger, stabs it into it, and does uh, his Spearing Spine effigy effect. Werewolf takes 2d6 psychic damage. Or 6. Okay. Despite the fact that when Varian struck him, um, he didn't react to the blow, he reacts to this one. You, you see him flinch and pull away. Um, less with pain, and more like with something akin to fear. Um, but that's not enough to actually deter him. Uh, after the moment, after that brief moment of, of fear and shaking his head, his focus returns on Brook. Okay, that ends Pip's turn. Okay, and then still you, Austin. Yeah, on to Pax. will move up here. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's do a, a Tasha's Mind Whip on the werewolf. He needs to make an intelligence saving throw. 16? Uh, it fails, because Pontifex is a beast. <laughs> <laughs> He's a frog. <laughs> okay, uh, Krokko takes 3d6 psychic damage. It can't take a reaction on its turn, and on its next turn it must choose whether it gets a move, an action, or a bonus action. It only gets one of the three. Uh, do we have something here to reflect to that? Uh, up, 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 up. Nah, not really. Okay. Um, I'll put it in his name so I can remember, hopefully. Uh, this is uh, 
Mind whip? Yes. Okay, here we go. Hopefully, hopefully I remember this by the time we're back to, to his turn. Also... Um... Oh, go ahead. I just need to swap my dry erase because I forgot this one is out of ink. Okay. What else were you going to say? I think Pontifex will use Manifest Mind to summon his... How did he describe it? It's like a a version of it's his astrolabe, right? astrolabe. Yeah. Yeah. Is it actually his astrolabe or is does it I... just like appear as his astrolabe? I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, I don't remember. <laughs> oh no, we're letting Matt down. <laughs> I can't make a copy, astrolabe. but I think he but just made like a, a copy of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use a ball, indeed. Uh, you can make a copy. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, and would you like for it to be up in the air? Um, maybe like five feet up right here. Uh, oh god, what have I done? I've got, the... I've got, yeah. Yep, okay. Let me put this back Thank in you. here. Okay, that's it. Okay. <clears throat> Bitter Frost reaches back and has to like hunch down in order to actually make uh, um, physical contact with Nefarianat, uh, extending one of his arms. Uh, his arms are like thicker than all of Nefarianat is. Um, they touch their fingers together uh, and Nefarianat will finish his casting uh, of Fly. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, no. <clears throat> does he also grow wings? Or does he just levitate? Well, uh, since his flying speed essentially doubles, um, this essentially becomes a living snowstorm. Uh, nice. The snow that holds together the shape that is bitter frost, it expands outward a little bit. Almost feels like his form has been just undone. Uh, and then it is suddenly upon you. Uh, let's see, what is uh, 60 feet? Uh, and it has already spent... It has spent five. They're, they, they're cumulative. Uh, what is this bonus action again? Oh, wrong side block. Right. Um, what have we got? It, it's gonna fly past these uh, stalagmites, um, and Burfrost grabs some of them, like handfuls of them, and snaps them off and looks off into the distance and, and says, First, I'm coming for you, and then I'm coming for that stupid cat. And it's going to just chuck <laughs> these uh, um, these stalagmites at Tekka. Uh, you were dodging, right? So it's a disadvantage. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is within his ridiculous uh, uh, range. Uh, uh, range. So. Uh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm chuckling. Uh, that natural 20 does not happen, because his advantage so instead it's a 13 to hit Tekka. Does that hit? Does not, okay. The second attack is a natural 1, uh, so the... Uh, it's quite embarrassing, a bit Bitter Frost it just essentially drops the stalagmites and just goes, whoops, and then picks it back <laughs> up. Third attack towards the Tekka. Does a 19 hit? That does. Joy! We're doing something this round. Thirty-six points of piercing damage. Ah! Oh! oh. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, would you call this a ranged attack? It is a ranged attack. 
Cool. It's great. not magical because it's just ice. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, let me roll some dice, hey? Oh, dice <laughs> rolling. That's what this game is about. Three. Mm-hmm. Uh, so did you say thirty-six? Yes. Okay. Um. So what kind of attack was this? This third attack. Um, just a really sharp, really long piece of ice thrown at you like a like a javelin. Um, okay. You've been dodging one. The second one didn't even get anywhere close to you. You didn't even have to move. Um, and as you prepared for the third one, it was just perfectly thrown, not at where you were standing, but where you instinctively moved to avoid it. Um, and you are struck um, on one of your legs, and this really wide gash opens and you begin to bleed. Yeah, Unless, so what I, I don't know what you're rolling for. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so it's actually this is just called deflect missiles. So I think ah. this is sort of like a kick that is dampening the impact, but it's still like the, the sharp like cut happens, but it's not as uh, fast or as strong as it could have been. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so just taking less damage, but still ouchy, still bad. Okay. Yeah, if it wasn't for your quick reflexes, you might have lost your leg right there. Uh, yes. And instead, uh, you, you're, you're still standing. You're fine. Mm. Uh, but you have experienced the, just the sheer strength of this living embodiment of winter, uh, who is not only seemingly upset at the uh, Seraphis, but uh, uh, also kind of enjoying this. Like he's been looking forward to actually beating you up. Uh, you understand now on the, from their personalities. Nefari and Etta loved to mess with you guys while he was in disguise, but Bitterfrost wanted to just move on to the violence aspect of their game, and he is loving it. Brook, back to you, top of the round. <coughs> Alright, I'm gonna start hitting him as well. <laughs> Twenty-six hits. Yeah, very good. Uh, one radiant damage, fifteen slashing. Is that with Virian's bonus too? No. What is Virian's bonus? Plus five. I and think. Damage. Uh, four plus four. Yeah, it, it has Dang been a while since you played. Clearly. Just from standing close to her. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's uh, 20. Uh, and also just from... Oh, sorry, remind me. What is What type of damage is Virion add? Uh, bonus. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it adds on to, like, the, the weapon damage. Like, we're going to call it slashing, like, the rest of it. Uh, mm. And not... Yes. Not, yeah. It doesn't add to the Radiant. Correct. Um, <laughs> bonus type. <laughs> um, and I, I know Dennis has been missing a few sessions, but actually Brook himself has not felt the um, the confidence that being next to Viren used to inspire in him. And now he under now that he feels it again, he realizes that he's been missing all along. Uh, that the Viren that was with you guys for a while uh, was not the real one. And uh, this feels like a kind of subconscious confirmation that yeah, she's back. Uh, uh, so that was your first blow. All right. Okay. Just for one more time of confirmation, do I get anything to my initial roll as well? Nope. Just damage. All right. As long as you're within 25 feet of Virian, all weapon damage is a gets her charisma added to it. I like that. Hits. All right. So. Uh, 12 slashing for Radiant. So much math. Mm -hmm. You can see that where your blade cuts into the werewolf, it, uh, the, the wound that you leave behind, it crackles with divine radiant energy. Uh, the wounds 
keep on burning even after you have inflicted it. Uh, now that uh, the werewolf is no longer exactly alive, um, you can see that your, your weapon is doing so much more damage to him. He just needs to roll higher! <laughs> Anything else? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay, moving on to Arin, uh, who is in a reasonably fine position. Um, hmm. So the range on his bow is like 150 before we even approach a um, disadvantage, so maybe he can come here to give a hand to Taka, who's just on his own. Uh, this is good enough with the, like, the arc of the arrow to start shooting a bit of frost. Uh, so he'll be doing just that. Uh, he will use a bit of section for Planar Warrior. Uh, oh wait. Oh, that is a range of 60 feet. Okay, he can't do that quite yet, can he? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, no. Um, we'll keep that for later. Uh, instead, this is an... 30, 20 to hit, and... Uh, oh, forgot to write this down. So that's a hit and a miss. His bow is magical. He's going to do this much damage. Uh, Tech can see one arrow um, released by Arin's bow. Um, just strike a bit of frost, and it's exactly like shooting a snowman. The arrow just kind of stays there, um, clinging onto the snow, not falling off. Um, Bitterfrost doesn't bleed, uh, hardly reacts to the blow. Um, he, he just reaches down and pulls the arrow and snaps it in half and tosses it off uh, and laughs as it does so. Here we on. All right, this thing is the wolf's mind whip, right? So he's a little, yeah, a little stunned looking. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just seeing that it's not fully paying attention, Viren takes the opportunity to sort of like just kind of duck back around over here a little bit, put a little space between her and it. And as she does so, she kind of just gets back up to Brook, just reassuring him that she's still here and just says, we can take him. We, uh, we can take him down. And we'll use her warlord's favor on him. So you heal nine and get four ten hit points. And then uh, you see, like, reach like for like where her gun would be, but instead of drawing it, she just sort of reaches and just pulls out lights and sort of raises her hand, and this silver fire descends down on the werewolf, and she will cast Sacred Flame, and he needs to make a deck save. Dex save, dex save. You see 16. It's not bad at saves, but I did roll poorly on this one. That's a 10. Alright, so he takes 2d8 radiance. Ooh. It's good to have you back. Yes, 11 radiance. Eleven. Got it. And that will be my turn. Uh, and for you as well, you're... And this is... This is relatively new for you. Um, this magic that you've only had for, for what, a few days? Yes, yeah, so um, she looks a little surprised that she just did this, honestly. It... it uh, it's odd. It kind of came naturally to you, but at the same time, you wouldn't really be able to explain how you did it if you were to put it into words. Uh, you just know how to do it in the same way you know how to walk and talk. Um, and you can see that uh, your magic is just tearing apart in uh, this werewolf. Um, there is very little actual liquid blood left in this walking corpse. Um, but uh, your magic and even, and even Brooke's um, shining weapon, they are even cutting into the chains, and there's multiple rings of metal that are now hitting the ground, scattered all around. Uh, if that's everything, 
We'll move on that to Sunny. Everything. All right. <clears throat> she will also get closer. Actually, she can also. Eh. She can hit from here. All right. <clears throat> she is gonna try to attack. Twice. 23 hits. That's so 16 slashing. And the second one. Okay. Sunny herself struggles oh. a little bit. That's a hit. Um, to actually do. Um, meaningful damage to the werewolf. Uh, her weapon is not magical, uh, and her damage is resisted. Okay. Um. Any damage counts. Okay. Indeed. Uh, for her, since her weapon, it feels like almost like the blade isn't sharp. Uh, and so she's hacking uh, at the werewolf more than she's cutting. Uh, she's bruising him more than he, she's wounding him. Uh, but as you said, every little bit helps. That's it. That's her turn. Okay. Getting on to Nefarianet. Um... He is going to be strolling on over 30 this way. And all of you hear a familiar sound. The sound of fingers snapping. And everything comes to a standstill. The fairy net will cast a time stop. And he's okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes, five turns of time uh, that he can spend however he would like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> rolled maximum. Uh, he probably will not need all five, but this is a good time for him to um, move about the battlefield as he wishes. Uh, all of you perceive this as less as time having stopped and the the doll moving really quickly. Uh, you really, you feel like you're conscious throughout all of this, and you can just tell that your body's no longer moving at the speed it should, uh, and everything has gotten quiet around you, and you can hear just the very faint, soft footsteps of this little plushie uh, just getting around and doing as he wishes, as if the entire world uh, has... Is just giving him all the time he wants just for himself. And he uses that time. Um, like he, he strolls on over and he yawns and he stretches, extending his arms over his head and he even like bends forward to touch his toes and looks around and shows off a bit of a grin most of you can't really like m move your eyes in order to look at him and see what he's even doing um you just see him shuffling around uh, uh in just in the corner of your eyes uh, i actually don't have to come all the way here uh, because this has quite a range. Uh, he comes on over. And he takes a look at the situation at where everyone is standing. And he goes all the way back next to his buddy. Uh, and holds out a little, tiny little arm. And says, okay, let's say, um, right there. Uh, and he will be casting another spell. Now, the nature of this uh, spell... 
So it's a dome, it's a circle, it's a cylinder. Uh, is that as soon as you're affected by any of his actions, uh, time resumes uh, flowing normally. Uh, so this is really the, the only major uh, thing that happens, and then everything will resume uh, working at normal speed. Uh, I need uh, a 10 foot radius. Is there no 20 foot radius? Wait, is this 10? I need a 20 foot radius, but this goes from 10 straight to 40? Why? Because it has to be 10, then. No, it doesn't! Oh, that's upsetting. Uh, I'll just get one of the other radiuses. Like, this is a circle. Yeah, there we go. That's a 20 foot circle. Boom, perfect. Um, what's the most people I can get in this? I can get the three of them, or. The three of them? Ah. How could Pip and Tekka be exactly four to five feet apart? <laughs> well <laughs> done, well done sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we'll go for the back row like this. Uh, in this particular spot, uh, a storm of ice will suddenly billow. Uh, everybody in this radius needs to roll a dexterity saving throw. Not good One news of them for is the me. Two of them are Austin. Arin fails. Pip fails. This one's professors. Pontifex fails. All fails. Um, it's as if. The ice that on the ceiling uh, suddenly just begins to hail down on all of you, uh, and even the frozen over surface of the uh, the the floor beneath your feet it rises up. Uh, it becomes sharp as if covered in thorns of ice uh, and I might digs use into your feet. On this oh, go ahead. Tip. Using stone stair spiration. Ha. Huh. Nope. <laughs> What'd you roll? Nine. Total? Yeah, well, no, but it's lower than what it was last ah. time. Oh, dang it, you brought my 69 dice total up to 70. Oh. Oh, well. Oh, so sorry. Well, it's miserable now. Okay, so the <laughs> three of you are going to take nine points of bludgeoning damage. These are different dice. It's very annoying that I have to do this. And 17 points of cold damage. Oh crap, I put away my dice. I said 17 and what? <laughs> the same nine? Nine. Okay. That means 26 total because Arin doesn't resist either type. This area, I'm going to leave the uh, the marker out, uh, is all difficult terrain now, uh, as it is fully iced over. And Neferian attends uh, his uh, final turn before time resumes uh, flowing normally. I, I didn't ride behind Bitter Frost. Well, in fact, Bitter Frost is going to move, so you'll be behind uh, uh, this tiny bit of cover. Uh, he strolls on over as all of you slowly over the course of the next two, three seconds resume moving normally and everything is back to normal. And it's Tekka's turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Tekka immediately looks to his right and just this storm. Just like, uh, yeah, these spikes of ice rising. Um, I will probably just try to get away from that because that looks bad. 
Uh, so running up to, uh, I think that should be 35. I think he's gonna dodge again, cause yeah, that hurt real bad. <laughs> kind of acting and like a target, but also making sure not to just straight up throw your life away. Um, you get ready for more pain. Yep, pretty much. Surface has uh, like, this is a cylinder. So he reached all the way up to where she is. This pillar here reaches the ceiling. There's just enough space for somebody to potentially stay up here. Um, and the storm of snow and ice it took, took place just a few feet away from her. What is she doing? Um, <laughs> I don't know. What can she even do? <laughs> Let's see. I think she's going to just stay right there. She's not much of a fighter. She's more of a moral support. And yeah. uh, all of her skills are she's, not really about she's combat. She's watching to make sure no invisible things sneak up. On Indeed. Us. Which is like, that's what, why Pontifex summoned her. That's what uh, she is in this cave for. Uh, and she has given Pontifex no signal that there is anything other than your three enemies facing you. Um. Does something happen when a wolf starts to turn in the bonfire, or nope. is it at the end? Just if it ends, it's turning. Okay. And the mind whip means that... It can uh, take an action, bonus action, or move, but it can only pick one. Okay. Well, then it's just going to keep attacking Brooke. I would like to cast... I forgot what it's called. Blood Curse of the Eyeless Amplify. So I take damage and then it reduces like 1d6 from all of his attack rolls. Okay. Um, blood pour pours out from the wound you have inflicted to yourself earlier. Um, on the palm of your hand before the werewolf even moves to attack again. Um, that blood, it's mirrored by the werewolf's own injuries where he also seems to suddenly bleed out more um, just for seemingly no obvious reason. Uh, and his eyes, already bloodshot, uh, you, you only see red at this point. Uh, he's essentially like partially blinded as he goes for these uh, following few swings. Um, it's not his advantage, it's just minus a roll, right? Minus 1d6, yeah, I can roll for mm -hmm. the first one. Okay, begin rolling. Uh, I will need three rolls, so that's minus two on the first bite, uh, which is... It becomes... A 17? Nope. Ooh. Okay, on the second one, minus one, that's the clause, uh, that becomes uh, 24. Yeah, it's... oh god. Can I, oh, um, protection that one? What does that do? Uh, makes him roll with disadvantage. Okay, we'll do that again on the second claw attack, which is still at a minus one. Uh, and that becomes... a 15 to hit? No! The third one, which is also minus one, the third claw attack, becomes 26. Yeah. Oops. Missed. Missed one. Uh, so of these three attacks, um, as Virion manages to interpose her shield between you and the werewolf for one of the claw attacks, and the sound that the claws make scraping against your shield of light is unlike anything you ever heard before. It's really odd. 
Uh, you're only hit by the second swing with the other arm. The werewolf sluggish, blind, but still going for you with everything he's got. The claws are 35 points of magical slashing damage on the one attack <laughs> oh. that went through. Uh, have you been so... removing your MP3? No, oh, I am doing it now. Yeah, okay. 34 you said or 35? 35. 35. Okay. You're fine. Uh, he You're can fine. choose. So two questions. One, um, can choose to to move if he attacked. So he uh, he remains in the bonfire. Uh, but yeah. that's not a question. It's more of a, like you go ahead and roll the damage. The, the second thing is, does the mind whip remain? Uh, it does not. Um, okay, so it was just. But it does need turn. to make a dex save again before any damage can be done. Okay. Twenty five. Okay, it succeeds. <laughs> I'm getting the feeling that uh, it's good at deck saves. <laughs> nah. Uh-uh. That uh, uh, leads us to Pip. Pip is going to walk out of the Storm of Death. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be difficult uh, terrain uh, on the first step. And then oh. you're out of it. So 5-10... Five thirty. Um, let's see here. Let's do Mind Sliver on the White Werewolf. Intelligence save. Sixteen. It just succeeds. Um, <clears throat> bonus action, Pip is going to stab the effigy. Werewolf takes 2d6 psychic damage. Or eight points. Okay. Damn. Uh, once again, you see him flinching at this and bringing a, a clawed hand up to his head and then shaking it off. Uh, for the first time with being this close, uh, even though the werewolf's focus remains mostly on Brook, but this is the first time where like he actually looks at you and you make eye contact and you can just see the... the uh, the jewel dripping from his mouth. Uh, he looks just completely driven by rage. And he l looks at you like he actually sees you. Yikes! Yeah, that'll be Pip's turn. Pontifex! Uh, bonus action, Pontifex is going to move the uh, astrolabe 30 feet straight up. I changed it on here, and it disappeared. <laughs> I... My chat log said, not loading garbage object. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Let's see if that happens again. Oh. How is a garbage object? It's gone. What are garbage you trying to do? Object. Why does this happen? Like, what are you doing? I'm trying to make it just change to 30 feet. Okay, let me let me look at it. So. Broke it, not a number. Dang. Yeah. Anyway, this is thirty feet up. We <laughs> want to just move it and lock it. Ah, uh, boop. Can you change its name? Um, maybe. Okay, if you could put like just 30 feet in its name, then we'll know. It is 35 feet up. 35, perfect. Um, and then Pontifex is going to cast through the astrolabe a fifth level fireball on them. Q. 
Good call. They need to make uh, deck saves. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. All right, uh, Nefarianat rolls e seven, and Bitter Frost is like backwards, but Bitter Frost rolls an eighteen. <laughs> wow! It's Can not Bitter Frost succeed? <laughs> supposed to go like this. Yeah, and Bitter Frost is the one who these made us know. Yeah. All right, uh, then 10d6 fire damage. That's 32 points on the Farionet and half as that much on Bitter Frost. Hilarious, it just means that they both take 32. Oh. <laughs> the summons make uh, the fire? No. Uh, most of you have uh, a bunch of, like, rocks part of the wall of the cave in the way, uh, but uh, you hear Bitter Frost and Ethereum that's, like, just complaining about being a pain. Like, the just the owls that you would expect from something more mild than a, than a fireball. Uh, but regardless, they're hit. And the professor will just hobble out of here. Half of 32 is 16 um, for concentration. And close that. Uh, con, con, con. Where's my con? And uh, uh, that makes it a 19. Uh, so fly is still in effect. Alright. That'll end Professor's turn. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to Bitter Frost. Let's see what we've got. One, two, three. Um, fly is 60 feet of movement, so... It's 25 to here. Uh, this is an extra fly to go over. Uh, fly? An extra five to go over. Uh... So we have plenty to get to Tekka. Uh, Tekka, you are approached by... You just left behind you a snowstorm, and there's a second one that comes right up uh, at you. Um, the, <laughs> the snow that makes up Bitter Frost, somehow it's all scattering in every direction and floating, but when it comes down on you, it feels very solid, very heavy, very hard. Uh, it's going to attempt to uh, slam attacks on you uh, it's a disadvantage because you're dodging so the first one is a 16. that's not hit the second one the lowest is a 19. that hits and the third one the lowest is a 22. that also hits Rip. which means First one is 18 points of bludgeoning damage. Mm -hmm. The second one is uh, 17. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice. 17 for the second one. All right. Uh, yeah, I, again, I think it's just like. It's a bunch of like shards just in Tekka's body at this point, like ice shards, uh, solid hail, and it is not looking good. Like I think Tekka is on one knee trying to support himself with the core staff at this point. Um, that is a pretty good description. Um, it, it's there is just eyes and needles that are that have stabbed you all over your body you're bruised you can feel that some of your bones have cracked uh, and there's straight up needles in your body uh you're 
also weak enough uh, that I think we need a, a saving throw, don't we? Uh, I believe that is... Oh, it's when you start your turn. Yeah, I believe okay, so. Okay, then we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, that's the end of Bitter Frost's turn, so that brings us back to Brook. All right, I will keep hitting. All right. 23 hits. Uh -huh. One radiant, 14 slashing. Got it. My team. Mm -hmm. Six radiant, fourteen slashing. Brooke, uh, despite the injuries you have already sustained, you're holding your ground and you're hitting as hard as you can. Um, years of training. Do not let you down. Uh, your, all of your strikes, they are precise. They are sharp. Uh, the werewolf is massive uh, and slowed by the psychic damage and just by the fact that it's no longer a living creature. Uh, and on your second blow, you cut off one of its arms. It falls down to the ground and it barely bleeds. And the werewolf himself seems to not even notice. Oh god. Only one? I guess that at least means that it's one attack last. <laughs> hey. Anything else in your turn? <laughs> um, don't think so, no. Okay, that brings us to Arn, who's going to step out of here. Uh, so he's on this tile. Is he 60 feet to, uh, within? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, comes cr crawling out, tumbling out from the area of uh, uh, the, the, the storming area uh, and approaches and comes to lend a hand to, to Tekka uh, in the best way that he can. Uh, the next time he shoots his arrows, uh, they glow with this uh, uh, bluish light. They leave behind a sparkling trail as they fly towards Bitter Frost. Um, the first... Where did I put my d20? Here it is. Uh, the first attack is a 21 to hit. That's a hit. And the second one is also a hit. Damage is this much plus force damage um all damage dealt by the attack becomes force damage next time okay it's just on the first arrow ah so it's a one-time thing so three plus four plus and the second one Uh, as he shouts at Tekka to hold on, um, Orange shoots two arrows, both of them landing uh, within Bitter Frost's body. Uh, one of them leaving behind this far wider hole than the width of the arrow itself. Uh, and the snow that makes up Bitter Frost, it sort of ripples out uh, and then settles back in. Virion. All right. Um, so looking at this, now one-armed werewolf on the ground, still focusing on Brook and or Pip. Um, she again looks like she draws her gun and takes a minute to aim at the werewolf right between the eyes if she can. And when she pulls the trigger, it's not a bullet, but just a streak of light, and she will cast Guiding Bolts. Uh, a bonus action <laughs> steady aim, then Guiding Bolts. So... Okay. Roll your attack. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry, I didn't remember what my spell attack is because I'm new at this. Plus eight. Love the flavor for Guiding Bolt. Thank you. I mean, she's got a gun, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guiding Bullet. Epic. And I'm gonna crit fish because I'm an elf. Mm hmm. <laughs> Wait. <gasps> oh, shit! Oh! Let's go! Oh! <laughs> So, is this right. why Pontifex called her fish lady? Because he crit, she crit fishes? That's, yes. That must be it. And uh, so that is going to be um, this much radiant damage. Oh, oh, which <laughs> is doubled because uh, it's uh, the wolf is weak to it. Uh -huh. So, Irin, how would you like to do this? I said it's... There's no also, like hold on. I, to it. <laughs> just Sorry, pause in the music. That's my <laughs> software freezing. I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> there it yeah, is. <laughs> yeah, she just lines up the shot like right between its eyes and just I'll put you out of your misery. And there's a little almost kindness to it, and she just said right between the eyes, just one and done. The beam of light that emerges from the uh, from Virion's pistol uh, is the most intense purest white light any of you have ever seen uh, it hurts to watch, it leaves behind an after image uh, on your eyes uh, th as you blink a few moments later the werewolf is down on the ground his entire head is gone, burnt off Virun puts an end to the life or the unlife of this werewolf that has been chasing you down for months. And he dies here, at her hands, in this cave, in the middle of Ladaria. Not having achieved the only thing he had left to do. Let me take your trophy. Ooh. Well done. It Thank just you. looks down at his effigy and watches as <laughs> it, all the fur and hair that was on it burns off and just left with a blank slate once more. That is my turn. She like, turns her attention over to Bitterfrost, but cannot move. Just in time to in time to see Tekka in dire uh, danger. Ah, uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sunny's turn. <clears throat> Can she get over there? And twenty five thirty. Yeah. Cool. Um twenty five thirty. Kirashes to Tekka's aid. Tries Tekka! Tekka! Steps right next to him. And probably tries to get the attention of Bitter Frost to herself and attack Bitter Frost. <clears throat> Sunny finds that it's such an odd feeling uh, to be trying to strike down a bunch of snow, uh, but she will put just all of her strength behind her blood. Yeah. She's still in Viren's range, I assume? Yep, 25 feet. 17. Whoops, that's um. not... Sorry, I can do math. Okay. <laughs> and then the last hit. They're both hits. Her snow is just uh, her what? Her sword is chopping off bits of snow, uh, just grating down this this golem uh, bit by bit. But uh, uh, there is still so much more to be done. It feels better than hitting the rebel soul ride. Uh, oh, you mean 
No. No, he, oh. he doesn't. <laughs> no. Maybe it is a sword. Maybe it is no. a sword. It's a dull blade. I forgot to sharpen it before. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's also resistant to we need to get Sunny a magical sword. Uh, this is becoming a problem for her. <laughs> Alright, that's our turn. Okay. That brings us back to Neferonet. Uh and there is an issue that Neferonet hadn't considered, so uh, the little plushie actually begins to move forward a little bit. Uh, over here. Okay. Uh, what have we got? Not a whole lot of line of sight. Uh, but... We can see Arn. So, I guess Arn will be at the end of this. Um, Neferonet glances over in various general direction. Uh, the two of them can't really see each other. There's a bit, there's uh, too many obstacles. Neferonet is really short. Uh, so it's mainly Arn who happens to have his focus uh, on the plushie uh, as uh, Neferonet brings uh, the attention back to him and then extends a tiny little arm and points towards Arn uh, and mimics the shape of Virion's gun with his fingers, and he says, Bang! Ah, uh, and he'll be casting Finger of Death on Arryn. Oh god. Uh, I don't actually have to roll for the constitution saving throw or for the damage, because Arryn happens to be entirely immune to necrotic damage. <laughs> 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 so... You're lucky that this was, like, my only available target. Um, it just kind of happened. Uh, there oh. is this... Much like you've never seen a burst of such pure light uh, as Virion's attack, none of you have ever seen uh, something so dark, uh, as if shadows themselves have condensed themselves into a beam of the opposite of light. Uh, and... Uh, the further it goes from Neferionet, the more it expands outward into a wider radius and it completely envelops Arryn. And even those of you who haven't been hit by it, you can feel like it's taking your breath away. It's taking your life out of your body, just luring it out. Uh, and you all look in horror at Arryn, who just stands there. The shadows do not cling onto him and it just disperses and he is completely unscathed. Uh, he had to put his arms in front of his face reflectively to protect himself and he slowly lowers them and looks around and says, Huh. And Neferonet says, <laughs> Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's odd. I didn't see any chains on you. You guys are full of secrets, aren't you? I suppose this is going to be a lot more fun than I had thought. That brings us to Tekka's turn. Uh, Tekka, yeah, may amidst... I have your wisdom saving throw? Absolutely. Uh, let us see here. I'm sure nothing could go wrong here. Absolutely not. Uh... We're fine. 17 We're fine. Yeah. Uh, so amidst groans and rab ragged like gasp for air, uh, Tekka gives like a faint uh, glance over at Sunny, trying to grab Bitterfrost's attention. Uh, and so he closes his eyes and focuses his breathing. And after a few seconds, it's, it's as if some of these needles uh particularly on his torso is like beginning to melt off like they're, they're no longer piercing his body uh as he is using uh let's see find the name to make sure wholeness of body and regains some health points Ooh. and yeah very nifty oh. and then afterwards uh you know taking enough damage enough broken bows for today so he's going to use Step of the Wind to disengage. Ta -da! <laughs> uh, and then I he's going <laughs> to... 
Uh, and uh, with that windy step, he is sort of like pole vaulting using his quarter staff up these platforms. So like, and they're just rolling onto each new level uh, as he is dashing to the top. Uh, that is so cool. <laughs> How much did you heal? Uh, uh, so that is 27, I believe. Oh! Yes. 27. Dang. And that will be the end of his turn. Okay. Surface is watching all of this happen. Austin, nothing from her? Nope. Okay, she, Pip. She, is, she doesn't care. That's fine. We'll leave her out for the rest of the fight. We, we know. Unless you tell me otherwise. Oh, Pip's this area go... is no longer uh, difficult to rain. Pip's going to go up here next to Tekka. This is so difficult. But on the side. <clears throat> and Pip will just be like, don't worry, Tekka. I'll protect you. Um, and as he's running, um, the fire that was on the other side of the battlefield gets sucked back into his iron ring, and he redirects it towards Bitter Frost, putting it right here. Um, Bitter Frost needs to make a deck save. <clears throat> Nine. Nine fails. So Bitter Frost takes 2d8 fire damage. For 14. Doubled? I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Bonus action. Pip is going to use his telekinetic shove to pull Nefarianet in five feet. It, he needs to make a string save. He? It? They? Her? Uh, they're all he. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> seven? Uh, nope. Nefarianet gets... Yoop. Yeah, deck saves on Bitter Frost and the strength saves on the Fair and that is the way to go. <laughs> As he goes, whoa! <laughs> and Pip just says, no more games! That's it. Pip, roll a persuasion check. Huh. Mm. That's a uh, 14. Okay, uh, from uh, his new uh, vintage point, uh, he looks down at a doll who brings up a a little paw to his chin and uh, mimics like the gesture of considering it. And and Nifernet says, "Hmm, well, I suppose we have done what we came here to do." Um. Uh, and uh, calls out to Bitter Frost and says, What do you say, old pal? Are we done? And Bitter Frost just lets out this howl uh, and says, I am not done yet! <laughs> <laughs> and the Vernet gives Pip this look, like, like you know, like, I tried. <laughs> Ontifex's turn. Okay, well, I guess then go for it, Professor. <laughs> Fireball. <laughs> Nefarianet will counterspell it. Uh, Pip will counterspell the counterspell. Oh, okay. Um, so, I have counterspelled with this spell slot, which is a fifth. Uh, Pip is also uh, fifth. <laughs> oh, wait. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah. If they meet. Oh! <laughs> okay. I couldn't counterspell the previous one because never that had no line of sight to the astrolabe, but now it could. So you see, uh, like Pip gives a signal to Pontifex. Pontifex, like you hear him from all the way in the back of the cave, shouting his arcane words, um, <laughs> barely hearing him over the the sounds of the rest of the battle. Um, 
the his astrolabe third, bursts. Hmm? His third, fourth level fireball. It's fourth level. Okay. Yep. Um, you see the astrolabe bursting into flames, and the fire gets like it expands outward first, then inward, as if the flames are condensed, and then that the, those flames burst out uh, towards the two of them. And you see Neferina, you hear Neferina just saying, "How about no?" Um, and the f it the doll does like a motion as if hitting with a baseball bat. The flames are. Uh, are uh, just slingshotted back towards the astrolabe. Uh, and Paper, what does your counter spell look like? Uh, Pip just says, I said no more games! And then he, he puts his hand up and with his mind telekinetically shoves the fireball back, slamming down into the ground. <laughs> and these, these are both <laughs> failed deck saves. So roll the damage. Okay. And Pip, you be... can see, and you're really the only person who can see this, but Neferinet, as much as uh, a doll can emote, is for the first time genuinely surprised. 96 fire damage for 36 points. <laughs> okay. 36 on Neferinet. Um, plus this much. And uh, 36, oops, times two on Bitter Frost, which is a total of this much. Uh, Bitter Frost's hit points are this many. How would Pontifex like to undo Bitter Frost? <laughs> Um, well, I think, I think Pontifex would just like to see Bitterfrost just sort of slowly melt like that scene in, uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, just watches its, its whole body just melts off and starts <laughs> boiling on the ground. Uh, indeed, starting from, like, his feet. Uh, as the ground re it just remains completely hot, blistering hot, um, Bitterfrost reaches for Sunny, who pulls away from him, and Bitterfrost no longer has any legs to chase after her. Uh, he tries to pull himself onto this ledge, and he grabs onto it and manages to climb on it uh, with the top half of his body that melts away when his hands are inches away from reaching Pip. Uh, his voice uh, throughout all this uh, just keeps shouting, No! No! Until he's bubbled away into a steamy pile of uh, uh, water. Uh, I don't know whether to give this trophy to Austin or Matt. <laughs> we'll let Matt be surprised by it. I'll just, go right <laughs> just leave it there. <laughs> okay. And following this uh, explosion of flames, uh, Neferionet. Uh, puts out the flames that have caught onto um, his fabric and he looks up and he holds up his his arms Are you done? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm done And I have to say Watching my best friend die right in front of my eyes Oh it's so miserable. Mom will be happy. Yeah. I promised her a show. And as the plushie gives gives up and no longer fights you, uh, we're out of initiative. And we can end the session here. Ooh. Dang. Cliffhanger for next year. Cliffhanger for next year. Next year, <laughs> this episode wouldn't be a cliffhanger. The little yeah. one. I mean, this, this is a very small cliff right here. Honestly, it's a cliffhanger <laughs> more, more for me because I don't know if you're gonna like kill the fairy net. Jeez.
totally possible. But congratulations on surviving. Yay. Um, that is one powerful doll. Yeah. The world of dreams is his for, for him to shape. Dang. Ah. Uh, congratulations on killing the werewolf once and for all. He never did learn his name. And he will never bother you again. Don't yeah. make us feel bad, Winter. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, oh. he wasn't very conversational. <laughs> no, not after you killed his wife, really. Well, I still think it was the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, same here. Sometimes murder is justified. Oops. Yeah. I that just said case. murder's the right thing to do here. <laughs> you learn so you grew up so fast, Pip. That's what I've learned <laughs> from this whole experience. Sometimes murder is good. <laughs> it was either her innocent children that were trying to kill her. What about her children? Well, they didn't deserve it, but it's not really our fault. <laughs> I'm happy that, like, 60 sessions later, we're still talking about this. <laughs> I still debate whether this was the right thing to do or not. I wasn't here for that. I abstained. <laughs> so you were here for the ending. Yes. Uh, once more, thank you, Jory, for, like, playing along. Yeah. Um, and I hope you all had plenty of fun. Uh, yeah. I'll try to yeah. figure out why our little pedestal here is broken. <laughs> um... <laughs> Once, uh, once that's figured out, uh, oh god, yeah, I'll work on this later. Uh, but for now, I will let you go. I wish you all a lot of fun and delightful holidays and a happy beginning of a new year. And I will see you in a few weeks. Yes. Take care. See you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have a great, all of you, take have a care. great uh, rest of your year, everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. A Merry Christmas. Stay in touch. <laughs> you better. I'll never forget you. <laughs> it's gonna be like two weeks. You're fine. <laughs> it's so long. <laughs> All right. Bye, y'all. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.